This episode is brought to you by MyXP. MyXP is a ministry committed to solving problems for pastors, and they can help by coming along pastors weekly during the weekly connects. Find out more later in the show. Welcome to Doctrine and Devotion, a podcast exploring Christian faith and practice and some other stuff from a Reformed Baptist perspective. My name is Joe Thorne. I'm the lead pastor of Redeemer Fellowship in St. Charles, Illinois. And I'm Jimmy Fowler, executive pastor at Redeemer Fellowship. What is going on? Nothing. Nothing, no, and it's been beautiful. Nothing. Is, this has been a day. Oh, goodness. Where that the Lord has made. And Well, every day is the day the Lord has well, made. Well, this one, this one but, more. But you liked this one better. I liked this yeah, one. That hey, Lord, made. I like this, this one. This day is a good day. Why, and why was today such a good day for you? I did nothing. I just no. hung out with family. So you did, I mean, like, this is nothing. weird. Oh, did, I know. So, but, it, but you had to go to, you must have had to do some, some work for your, the big corporation. Nope. It, maybe some phone calls, maybe. Nope. Emails? Nope. Texts? No. You did nothing. Nothing. Okay, what about church, though? You probably had some church admin stuff to take care of. Nope. Wasn't there a church work day today? Like where know. everybody showed up and did the church work day? By everybody, you mean you and No, everybody. I don't go. I'm the lead pastor. <laughs> I don't, lead pastor. No, no, oh, okay. no, no, culture of honor. I don't, <laughs> I don't get my hands dirty. So, <laughs> so yeah, I didn't go to that either. Yeah, okay. Um, no, we couldn't. We, I couldn't. Um, and you mm. needed a break, goodness sakes. That, that's really exciting because I know so, yeah. you've been killing yourself um, for your vocation yep. and for both of them, really. So I'm excited. I got to relax today and I leave this week. Leave Thursday? Yeah, Thursday I leave for Kentucky. Mm-hmm. Head to Kentucky. Lake Barkley, Lake Kentucky. You're going to go fishing. Go fishing. You need to go to Lake of the Ozarks. Oh, is that where I need to go? Yeah, man. Is it good? I've never been Well, there. I used to go when I was a kid with my parents all the time. Mm. Uh, every year we would drive down to the Ozarks, uh, Bull Shoals Lake, and uh, cheap cabins, big lakes, lots of fishing. I know you like fishing. I don't, but there's mm-hmm. lots of fishing. Well, what were you catching? For real? Like, what I, were you- my dad, you'd have to, I don't know. I don't. I didn't do it. You didn't fish at all with your no, dad? No. Not heck, once? No. Heck no. Why? Why would I? No, but, but, That's a, it's just So what, you went terrible. fishing. No, okay, I didn't go fishing. Sorry, you went, I went, you, went on, the, you went on yeah, a vacation. Yeah. Your dad's fishing. You yeah. said, I don't want to go with my dad. My dad would get up at like four in the morning and go fishing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, or, no. or even in the afternoon no, or I don't, early I didn't morning, do that. late nope. evening. Nope. I would, uh, I would swim in the pool and I would just chill. That was it. And this was back in the 80s. There was no iPods, iPads, nothing like that. I would just. Walk around the forest and hang out and chill. I'm not fishing. All right. You know why? Because why you know I think it's cruel. You know, those, those fish have feelings, and well, I don't those, like. I, I don't so like, you wouldn't eat a fish? That, no, no, oh, no, no, nothing with a face. No, no, nothing no. with a face. Nothing with a not face. even a fish face. Not even. Hey, so wait, hold on the way. Let's wait, stop what? right there. So what? you don't eat burgers? Chicken wings? burgers don't have faces. What are you talking about? <laughs> 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 you dummy. <laughs> well, even for fish, burgers don't have face. There's no face on the fish when it's there's a face on the fish right there when it's when you catch it. When you catch it, mm-hmm. so because you didn't catch it, that's right. Don't or because count. wait, yeah, if you don't catch it, doesn't count. That's right. Your rationale is so. Yeah. Skewed. No, I am it's I, so so. I skewed. am a pseudo selective vegetarian, ideologically, but superficially. Yeah. It's from my, my, my I'm daughter. So proud of you right now. You know, I'm so proud of you right now, <laughs> man. Uh, well, I'm glad that we got that you made time on your do nothing day. Oh, it's the been once, good. A year day, yeah, <laughs> that you yeah, pretty much is. have, you know, God blesses you with to mm-hmm. sit down and talk about the 1689, man. Oh, of course, I need uh, this. I'm looking forward this to it. I got to do this. You know, you're, you're, you had your birthday. You're, yep. You're 36. Yep, I'm up there. Yep. And um, do you like? Do you like what I got you? You didn't get me anything. Stop it. What? Stop it. Okay. What do you mean? Do I like? What do you, you like got? what I got you? I like the cigars you chose. That uh, ultimately I paid for. Which. It, which is what the Opus X? Okay, so you liked what I got you? <laughs> yeah, they, yes, very there you good. Go. All right, I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm smoking one right now, so mm-hmm. I really got them for myself. I know you did. This is a really good cigar. I said to Michelle, Thank I was like, you. I want to grab these, and she goes, Yeah, yeah. Why? I'm like, Oh, I'm gonna give one to Joe. She's like, Oh, what? Are you? I'm like, Yeah, because I know, uh, I know he helped you, <laughs> and uh, and I know he did it for himself so that he can get one. <laughs> That's not why. <laughs> That's not why I didn't think you would give me one because you're usually not that generous. Hey, um, we're going to talk Whoa. about the 1689. <laughs> we are going. Jimmy's actually very generous, everybody. Uh, we are going to finish up chapter one. We're finally. finally done with chapter one of the 1689 on scripture. Yep. Chapter one. Today we're looking at verses, uh, paragraphs nine and ten. Mm-hmm. Uh, want to start with paragraph nine? 
Well, yeah, we should start with nine as opposed to ten. I'll go ahead and start emphasis reading, on you. Yeah, Do you yeah, yeah, want yeah, to start? I will with go ahead. Nine. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, that yes, was the, I, would, I would love to. Right. I would love to. All right, sixty-nine, chapter one, paragraph nine. The infallible rule of inter. <laughs> The infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself. And therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, which are not many but one, it must be searched by other places that speak more clearly. Clearly, yes. Yes, there it is. So, uh, paragraph nine, mm-hmm. um, what's the gist of it? Like, what what is the encouragement? Yeah. What is the comfort that we get from paragraph nine in the 1689? Well, it's kind of building off of what we talked about before, right, Joe, about that uh, – uh, scripture can be made known, right? That, but it's not equally clear. I think we talked about that uh, uh, when we talked about paragraph eight. If I, if mm-hmm. I remember correctly, yep, um, or maybe earlier than that. But either way, it's still building off that. And what it's saying is like, if you're reading something, let's say a, a passage in in Matthew, right? You can be uh, that's unclear. There might be a similar passage in Mark, right? That helps you to understand, or whether you're looking in in the Pauline epistles, you're, you're if there's something that's confusing, you look to other places in Scripture, right, to help shed light on on the meaning. So not all Scripture is equally clear, yep. right? We've been we've we've, we've been clear that. on that, yep. and um and when there are less clear passages, we should seek other passages of Scripture that address the same issue or topic mm-hmm. and use those that are more clear to shed light on less clear. Exactly, and this is called the analogy of Scripture. Yeah. Right? So the analogy of Scripture is this uh, biblical and very much Reformation principle that guides us in making sense of the Bible that we read. So, like, look, there, there's 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 two tendencies that I see. One is that people will say, like, "Oh, this this is unclear. We're just not going to understand it. We just it's need to give it up. Walk away. Mystery. Yep. And uh, since it's mystery, it's history. I'm out. I'm not going to do it anymore. See, like what I did there. Yeah. So, have, have you ever uh, actually heard anyone say that? Cause no. If not, that no. was really uh, really good of you. So, um, so yeah, I think that that there's a tendency to, to be dismissive because that's hard. I'm not going to do it. Mm-hmm. Instead of mining the rest of Scripture to help you make sense of that issue, it's almost like giving up. Yeah. It's almost like saying, "Well, okay, this is a little too difficult. I'm going to, like you said, move on." Right. Um, and I like I like how you said that uh, mining the rest of Scripture, right? And so it's that it's that sense of uh, even though you're, it's unclear here, it might be clearer somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it and it listen, not every doctrine is as unpacked as another doctrine. Some doctrines you only get a little bit of information on, um, and there is mystery. There really is mystery out there. But uh, we don't want to be dismissive. We don't want to be pessimistic about understanding the yeah. scripture that God has given us. So the one example that I see is people giving up, and then the other is when man people will find like i mean i don't want i'm not going to i'm not going to call anybody out i'm not even going to mm. give a real example mm. but let's just say there's there's like a verse or two mm. in the bible mm. that mentions one thing oh well, what would that one thing I'm, be? No, I'm just saying, like, I'm not going to say it, but like, it mentions like 1,000 like, years. I mean, one thing. One thing. And, or like, the, um, or like a, a prayer of Jabez. Or, or, <laughs> or a thousand year millennial reign. And it, 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 like, they'll take this like, oh, wow, it's mentioned here once. It isn't mentioned again anywhere else. And they build a huge complex doctrine out of it. Um, and what they're not doing is being careful to uh, use that scripture in its context yeah. and then seek to understand it, if it can be, uh, in light of other scripture and other contexts. And that actually brings up another issue. We've got the analogy of scripture, right, yeah, Jimmy? What's right. the other principle that we talk about? I mean, the other principle would be uh, the analogy of faith. Right. 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 And I think this one is, is a bit, the two together, it, it's not difficult to understand. Like, it can be confusing for some. Yeah, they even, get conflated all the time. All the time. And so I think the, the, I think the difference here, the way at least I understand and Joe can, uh, Please correct me. I got my buzzer right here. Right, All right ready. good. Good, good. Uh, is has to do with context, right? So as you're when we're talking about the analogy of scripture, I use the example of Matthew and Mark. Right. Uh, these are use utilizing uh, like a similar story or a similar event in scripture. And so in in one passage it's it's unclear. In another passage, there there's more information right. uh, to help you understand it. Um, when we talk about the analogy of faith, I think we're talking about, and I, I, I don't like using this word, Joe. So I, I, I oh, but you're going to use it. No, maybe I don't because it's going to confuse people when I say it. I, I don't think it's generalities. That's not the right word. Um, but if there's an, like there's a, there's a theme or there's an over, there's an overarching emphasis on, on a doctrine right. or an event. So uh, actually RBAP, 
our app on their website has a, a pretty good example of when we're talking about. Um, All right, let me let me just interrupt you right here. Go ahead. All right. So oh, this was so bad. Wrong. This was so terrible. I can't even. Um, All right, please go ahead. And, <laughs> I just wanted to use the app. Oh, um, no, no, no. You're right. You're right. Right. So while you're looking that up, let me just yep. let me just try and and push it uh, again. Please do. An algae of scripture. You're going to use scripture that speaks on a topic that is relatively clear, easier to understand, to help you make sense of passages uh, passages of scripture that are less clear, but also speak to the same issue. The analogy of faith yeah. has a. I don't know if broader is the more. See, is, that's why they want to use yeah. the word general, right? But but yeah, it's it's speaking. It's it's they're very similar, but it's speaking about a theological emphasis and unity that's found throughout all of Scripture. Good. Go. Go. So like, here's an example would be uh, from the rbap dot rbap website, um, and we'll link to this. An example of the proper understanding and use of the analogy of faith would be identifying the serpent of Genesis three. We can say with utter certainty that the serpent is the devil and Satan. We know this because God tells us via subsequent scripture in Revelation 12, 9, it says, And the great dragon was thrown down, the serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan, as well as in Revelation 22. And he laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan. So according to the analogy of faith, we can affirm that the serpent of Genesis 3 is the devil and Satan. Mm-hmm. So in this way, what we're talking about is if you look at Genesis 3, you don't have devil or satan in there right but we know it with utter certainty because we look at other passages of scripture uh in this case revelation uh 12 9 and right. 22 to shed light this understanding uh uh the doctrine of, of like, who satan is right yeah and so this is important right paragraph nine and this whole issue is important because a lot of us want to treat scripture like we're, we're so used to Instant gratification, download that app in three seconds or I'm not going to get it. It's like, I want the information now. I don't want to have to think about it. Yeah. I want to be able to read my Bible and get it and go. And reading your Bible and understanding your Bible are two different things. Oh, I agree. Understanding yeah. the scripture requires work, a lot of work. Sometimes you're going to read the scripture and it's just going to flood your soul with, with, with great peace and you're going to, you know, derive meaning from it and it's, it's going to be awesome. But other times, and for me, this is, and for Jimmy, like, especially when we're preaching. Yeah hermeneutics, Bible study can be gut wrenching. Oh yeah. It can be hard. It actually makes my stomach tight. Like, Oh yeah. Because I, I want to perspirate. I, uh, per, uh, uh, I don't perspirate. Oh, I perspirate. I sweat. I flop sweat. That's what I have. Chicks perspirate. What are you? Anyway. So, um, I'm just thinking like it, like you, 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 you're trying to make sense of this passage and you're not quite there and you're yeah. not sure. And you got to start reading other passages of scripture, uh, it, reading scripture and understanding it can take a lot of time. And so this ought to be an exhortation to us Oh right? yeah, that you're going to read scripture and for much of your life, you're going to have to do some hard work. It's not just going to fall into your lap, uh, you know, immediate download. You're not, uh, you're not installing uh, a new software that's just going to come online and make, it's all going to make sense. Uh, you actually have to do some, some real hard work here. Yeah. And I mean, and like you mentioned, Joe, I think it's, it takes time. This is a, the process that we're in. I mean, uh, from when we come to faith and until we go to glory, right? Like right. You're, you're going to be studying and studying and studying and still unclear and yet still mining and mining and mining. Yeah. And all the way, all, all the way along, we're encouraged because it is infallible. Yeah. Right. The, the word is trustworthy. It is perfect. The scripture is God breathed. Right. Um, and so we can trust it. We can't always trust ourselves. Oh, no. And we should be slow to trust ourselves, but we can trust the scripture. So check your presuppositions, you know, uh, check your own uh, pride and arrogance as you open the Bible and let the Bible be the very tool that God uses to help you to understand the Bible, right? Yeah, absolutely. And you know what, uh, Joe, speaking of of tools. Um, yeah, I know, who you're, I know who you're talking about. Who am I talking oh, about? Tyler. What a tool. <laughs> Tyler Drevitz. Oh, <laughs> Is that what you're going to say? I thought we, I thought we were transitioning to my XP. We are transitioning. Oh, yeah. So I, I helped. I helped. <laughs> you, yeah. This, you're welcome, Tyler. This, you're a tool. For the week of June, or not the week, for the month of June, uh, the guys over at my XP 
have been sponsoring the podcast. And so you can head on over to myxp.church and they're a ministry committed to solving problems for pastors. And what they do is uh, they connect weekly with people, a 60 minute weekly connect with an experienced executive pastor to outline the current problems and challenges that XP is then going to go to work behind the scenes, solving these problems. And they continue to work to uh, help strengthen all your systems uh, and, and communication. And so, I mean, that's just it. Like when, when it comes to pastoral ministry, Joe, I think one of the things we've talked about before is it can be, uh, it, it can be lonely. It can be, uh, it, it's, it is daunting. It is, uh, a struggle from time to time, and especially for a new church, a young church that doesn't, maybe it doesn't have the, uh, the elders established yet. Maybe it doesn't have deacons established yet. Right. Maybe you're just still trying, you've got your core team and you guys are all doing the best you can, but it's still, there, there's still a sense of, uh, the, a burden. You need on pastoral pastor. help. That's it. You Beyond need pa- what you get. Yeah, exactly. Pastoral help and pastoral care. Yeah. Some other individual that's going to to support you, to uh, hear you out, to uh, to help solve those problems. And so that's where that weekly connect is really useful. Is you've got an individual that uh, understands the struggles that you're going through, especially with with Tyler and and Ryan, as they've themselves have. Uh, uh, they're in the midst of church planting. They have planted uh, a successful church and they've worked at, at larger churches as well. So and they, now they're planting again. Yeah, exactly. They're killing it in Salt Lake City. By the way, hey, go ahead. You, you guys are going to go. And some of you are going to go. You're going to contact my XP. You're going to sign up. They're going to help you in your ministry and in your local church. Others of you aren't and your churches are going to die. Anyway. That's um, not those aren't the what? only two options. Oh, I, I thought they were. Okay. Um, <laughs> well, now I forgot what I was going to say <laughs> about my XP. Well, it, here's the here's the well, thing. Here's, I'm glad you forgot because what you said there was pretty well, that was pretty good. No, it does bad. You're you gonna that. sign up. Um, my XP. Some someone said recently on social media. Oh boy, my XP is a little off brand for doctrine and devotion. Oh no. And I said, well, you don't know my XP, and or you don't know us. That's right. Because uh, they are pastors who are getting it done, and they're going to help you when you don't have the resources to get it done. No church, like very few churches, I should say, very few churches are able to do all the work that they need to do without outside help. Right? You need counsel, you need coaching, you need assistance. That's right. Right. So that's what this is. This is a valuable um, partnership that you can have with MyXP that will make a real difference in your church. It's made a difference in our church. Oh, yeah. And uh, we recommend it to you. So head on over to myxp.church, schedule your free initial connect, and if you uh, sign up with them, and uh, you can save 30% off the first month if you mention Doctrine and Devotion. All right, so in paragraph 10, we're wrapping up chapter 1. In paragraph 10... Go uh, for it, Joe. Okay, you want me to read paragraph 10? Yes, go ahead. Okay, all right. Paragraph 10. The supreme judge by which all controversies of religion are to be determined and all decrees of councils, opinions of ancient writers, doctrines of men, and private spirits are to be examined and in whose sentence we are to rest can be no other but the holy scripture delivered by the spirit into which scripture so delivered our faith is finally resolved yeah this is a really important yeah. paragraph um not for, first of all for two people this is important for confessional christians reformed mm-hmm. christians because we do sometimes uh, have a tendency to elevate our confessional heritage oh, to yeah. the place of Scripture. Oh, yeah. Um, and we shouldn't do that. And the confession certainly doesn't do that. No, it, it tells you not to. I remember a bunch of knuckleheads over in the Reformed pub were saying that the Westminster was inerrant. I remember that. What are you talking? So Again, messed up. these are people that don't read the confession very carefully. These are people that don't understand the tradition. Um, the confessions are not inerrant. Even if they happen to be an accurate summary of truth and don't have any error, that doesn't mean that they're inerrant. Inerrancy is a theological concept, all right, that, that applies to Scripture only. Um, now, uh, when it's important for us, but it's also important for people who like to accuse the Reformed tradition of, mm-hmm. of abusing confessions or creeds as if um, they are on par with Scripture. The confessions don't teach that. They teach the opposite, don't they? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, the supreme judge, when it comes to the controversies of religion, the decrees of councils, the opinions of ancient writers, the doctrines of men, private spirits, they're to be examined and the sentence we are to rest can be no other but the Holy Scripture delivered right. by the Spirit. So, the you, you know, just because the uh, here's an example, like the example Joe just gave. If if you're one that uh, looks at at the confession and you're against the confession because you see these knuckleheads, like we saw at the at the Reform Pub, 
that look at a confession and and claim inerrancy for it, right? Just because some people don't un- quite understand because they're mistaken doesn't doesn't mean throw the rest out, right? And just because some people, you know, treat the uh, the 1689 or the Westminster Confession as an idol doesn't mean that they are inherently wrong either. Um, yeah. it, it, and we, we understand this in principle, right? Because if you're a Christian, you understand, hey, just because some Christians are jerks doesn't mean that all Christians are jerks. And just because some churches are bad doesn't mean Jesus is bad. You know that. But I even, I actually, I got a, um, I got a message on Facebook on one of my posts re, uh, this week. And um, let me bring it up. So I got, I got this comment and I know this guy, uh, this guy was at our church for a while. He's a nice guy. Mm. Um, so I, I put up this thing about the confession and his comment is creeds can quickly become idols of theological certainty. We put our faith in being right rather than putting our faith in God's love. Our echo chambers grow smaller and smaller in order to protect the idol. All right. So this was on a, like my, on when we did the 1689 chapter one, paragraphs seven and eight. Yeah. Yeah. So my response was, uh, thanks. <laughs> For the record, I've preached on, written on, and discussed via the podcast the danger of turning our theological confession into an idol. Um, and, and here's the thing. Uh, okay, yes, it's not really what we're talking about here, but this is when I, I get a little frustrated, and I actually threw this tweet out there or something this week. It's important for us to spend most of our critical energy on ourselves and on Absolutely. our own people, groups, and You're tribes. Right. Homeboy is no is not a part of the Reformed tradition, but he's he, but I see him frequently lobbing grenades and saying, "Hey, you guys need to deal with this." And, and maybe we do, absolutely. But um, maybe you ought to spend a little more time focusing on the abuses and the errors in your tradition or in your group. Uh, just like I think Calvinists should be spending much more time rebuking Calvinists oh, yes. than traditionalists. I agree, right? I think uh, that I think it, our, our energy would be better spent. All right, so the 1689 does say that, uh, and it says throughout chapter one here, that the scripture is our authority, the confession is not our authority, right? The scripture is our ultimate authority. It answers our questions. That's it, right. It is, it is what should bind our conscience, right? The scripture, um, and so we evaluate everything else based on it. So if we are going to resolve controversies, if we are going to resolve um uh, differences of opinion even. Um, we go to the Bible, but that requires something. If we're going to use the Scripture mm-hmm. to resolve our differences whenever possible, mm-hmm. what might that require of us? Well, I mean, that might re- require, I mean, that's going to require that we read mm-hmm. Scripture, that we right. study Scripture, that when Scripture is unclear in one place, that we search and mine Scripture for better clarity. Uh, that It requires good hermeneutics. Yeah. Right. It requires prayer. It, it requires the spirit of God to to illuminate scripture, to to give understanding for us. Right. I mean, this is this is the stuff that uh, as we look at scripture, I mean, it it it. It, it requires an open mind, and that's probably whoa, the, what? whoa, <laughs> whoa, what? open mind lets the demons in. <laughs> open mind lets the demons in every time. No, no, you need an open mind because here's the problem. I too often, because of my presuppositions, because of my theological background, because right. of uh, the things that that I've grown up or experienced, I come to scripture with a certain mindset. Sure, we all and do. We need to be challenged in that. Yeah. That as as a, as we're reading scripture, we need to have an open mind. That maybe this passage is not affirming what I thought it was affirming, right? But maybe it's actually rebuking and challenging me in my faith. Absolutely. And like, look, can the scripture be wrong? No. Can I be wrong? Yes. Can you be wrong? Yes. That's it. That's the whole point. Like, listen, uh, the, can the confession be wrong? Yes. Yeah, the confession can be wrong. In fact, Jimmy and I take issue with one aspect of the confession, mm-hmm. and it is the way that the, the Sabbath is ultimately unpacked. Um, we do believe that the fourth commandment is still binding. We do believe that uh, we are to keep the, the Lord's Day as a, as a Christian Sabbath. But the way that we believe it is to be kept is different from the way that the confession teaches and and the way that the Reformed tradition in general teaches. So, yeah, I mean, you could say that we're not truly Reformed or truly Calvinistic, but my, my, I'm, we're brought to that place because we're compelled by Scripture. I used to be a hardcore Sabbatarian um, in the most traditional Puritan way. What would that look like? I'm actually interested to hear that. Right, okay, so, uh, and we're going to get to this much later on in the series. Oh, so I don't want to spoil it then. No, it's, it's a long way away. So the, the Sabbatarian perspective is, uh, f- traditionally, that the, the Jewish Sabbath on Saturday 
uh, has been moved to Sunday yes. with the resurrection of Jesus. Yes. The church began to gather on the, on, on the Lord's Day. Yes. They would worship corporately on a Sunday. And so their day of rest from work and recreation and everything unnecessary save works of necessity and works of mercy, mm -hmm. those things ceased. Sunday was the day of rest. So um, in a practical, tangible sense, somebody's mowing the lawn out there. Yep. That's Pete. <laughs> Pete's out there mowing. Yep. My ADD kicks in. It's hard for me. I know. To like, I, can see, right. I see your eyes keep shifting. <laughs> so um, it, popularly today, what people are wrestling with who adopt that view is, okay, so it's the Lord's Day. I'm not supposed to work, and I'm not supposed to employ anybody to work because I'll be encouraging them to break the Sabbath. So I'm not going to get gas. Nope. I can't go to a restaurant. Can't go to a restaurant. Um, oh, you can't go on a reform pub. Yeah, that's I know. That's because uh, apparently that's work. Or, <laughs> I don't know what it is. Um, so they, 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 they have a bunch of uh, – they, they, they find themselves in a situation where they're, they're living in a pagan culture which knows nothing about a Sabbatarian practice, and they're trying to keep this Sabbatarian uh, law as, uh, as they follow Jesus. So – you know, what can you do? Are you allowed to cook a meal at home? Are you not allowed to cook a meal? And uh, and some Sabbatarians are very healthy. They have a very good perspective on things. Other Sabbatarians tend towards legalism and all kinds of burdensome rules and laws. Um, but in short, and we've talked about this, uh, we are convinced that that the Sabbath in the New Covenant is kept on the Lord's Day, but in the assembly of God's people. Yep. When you're assembled, you are keeping the Sabbath. Um, outside of the assembly... There is no Sabbath to keep, so I don't. We don't view it as a twenty-four hour period, uh, sundown to sundown, or whatever, whatever, you, what, what have you. Um, we see it a little bit different, and we could be wrong on that. And you know, maybe we are, but right now we're, we're not. We don't think we are. So yeah, the the point is, is that you've 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 got to. I, I agree with you. You got to have an open mind yeah. to the Scripture, and I think it's always best practice to to admit we can be wrong. We believe that even as regenerate men and women, our minds are still. Uh, darkened by the presence of sin, the principle of sin. Mm -hmm. And so we need to be looking to the scripture to c constantly um, challenge any area where there is sin or ignorance. Yeah. And I mean, I think this is best done within community. Absolutely. Right? I mean, oh, goodness. It, we need to be personally reading, but then we also need to be challenged corporately. We need to be challenged uh, while we're talking with, with those in our community group, Bible studies, missional communities, whatever you want to call them. As you hear the word of God proclaimed on a Sunday morning, it can't, it's not, it can't just be, uh, it's, it's just me and my Bible, right? right. Like that, that just, that lead, that, that'll oftentimes lead to heresy. That'll oftentimes lead oh, yeah. to uh, some, some real problems. Exactly. And so, you know, uh, if people are, are talking to you and they're challenging you and, and scripture is, correctly being applied, you know, because right. people could just throw scripture out. Oh, yeah, often, so I want to make sure I make that very clear that they're... heretics and false teachers love and the devil love to use the Bible. Exactly. So as but as you're praying and as you have an open mind, as you're diligently seeking that, then, yeah, sometimes you're going to have to change your view. But having going about it as a lone ranger um, just isn't isn't helpful. Yeah. Is it uh, uh, isn't edifying? Never go lone ranger. Or, Always, or Tonto. Oh, no, you can go Tonto. <laughs> I knew you. In this relationship, you, you would be Tonto. You, as soon as you I, would be Tonto, as soon as and I, I said, would be the as Lone Ranger. As soon as I said Lone Ranger, I'm like, darn yeah. it. <laughs> I was thinking of yeah. myself. I was like, yeah. great. Yeah, great analogy. Anyway. <laughs> I love that thing. I'm going to use it next time you preach. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm like, oh, that thing is so awesome. Hey, listen, we hope you guys are enjoying the conversation, and we hope that you're making use of the 1689.com. The 1689 confession .com. Uh, That's the URL. Uh, we've developed a website there where you can read the 1689. It's beautiful. It's laid mm. out wonderfully. I Easy to it. read. Works on your phone. I mean, it is just awesome. Absolutely. So be it. sure and, and look at that. Read that. Share that online if you would. You can follow uh, the 1689 on Twitter and on Instagram. But uh, yeah, get into that. Use that. And uh, next week, we're going to be jumping into paragraph. I'm sorry. Chapter, chapter two, two of God and the Holy Trinity. Boom. Mm. Well, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Doc and Devo or on Facebook slash Doctor and Devotion. You can head on our website, DrDevotion.com. There you can contact us. You can sign up for the email blast or hit up the store, JoFoStore.com, and grab some gear. Fresh pod every Monday and Thursday. Blog posts on Wednesdays. You know, video content sporadically, twice a year, once a year, when we get to it. Later. Later.